Thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is John Antonucci. I'm a Senior Business Development Manager with LPA Systems. Before we get to the main presentation, I want to tell you a little bit about LPA Systems and the focus services that we provide to IBM ASL Solution Delivery Partners. LPA is a premier business analytics partner, and for over 12 years, we've been providing solutions not only to end user partners, but working with ASL partners to help them implement Cognos in their industry software solution. We're one of only 10 Cognos core subcontract partners relied upon by the lab services organization to assist them in delivering solutions to their clients. We have developed a specialized and mature practice to assist IBM solution delivery partners to get their solution to market quickly using proven practices. We have a talented team of tenured consultants that not only have deep Cognos experience, but also deep expertise with the Cognos SDK, automation techniques, custom security provider implementations, and other things that are essential as part of delivering your solution to your clients. Finally, we are committed to the, en the enablement and self-sufficiency of solution delivery partners, because at the end of the day, you own the solution that you deliver to your client. Many of you will relate to the software development lifecycle diagram represented on this slide. The important message here is that LPA has a variety of services that can be delivered discreetly at any point in the project or continuously to help build out the entire solution. We can either build it with you, for you, but at the end of the day, we will do knowledge transfer so that you can own and operate the solution. Our value proposition is really pretty simple. We have significant experience in assisting over 60 partners to deliver solutions to their clients, accelerating their solution time to market. We're familiar with many of the special challenges that are sometimes faced by solution delivery partners, whether it be custom security provider, multi-tenancy, rebranding. There's a pretty good chance we have an approach to helping you solve that problem. We have high impacts consultants and a flexible phase delivery approach that'll help get you to market quickly. We work closely with the IBM team throughout the project to ensure success and to knock down obstacles that may occur. And finally, we are committed to enabling your organization's technical skills and making you self-sufficient so that you can own and deliver the solution to your clients. Here's a summary of some of the focus services we provide to solution delivery partners. Whether you're completely new to the program or an established partner, there's a pretty good chance that we can help. We can assist you with scoping activities. We can assist you with troubleshooting and diagnosing problems that may exist in your current solution. We have a variety of advisory services, whether it be around upgrading to newest versions of the product or OLAP or which reporting and dashboard tools to pick and when. And finally, we can deliver training to your team as well as directly to your clients. Please contact me if you'd like a copy of today's slides. Today's webinar is being recorded for rebroadcast. Thank you again for attending the webinar, and now on to the main presentation. Thank you, John. Hi, everyone. I'm Rich Chester. I'm the Director of Consulting for LPA, and I'll be starting us off today with a discussion of Cognos Mashup Services, um, and then I'll also talk about advanced visualizations using the Rave Engine. And then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, David Russell, who will talk about framework automation. And then we'll flip it back to me to do a, a quick discussion of uh, Cognos application theme branding. And then if there's time, uh, we'll take some questions and hopefully provide some answers. And so let's get into it. Let's talk about CMS, Cognos Mashup Services. So CMS is a programmatic way for you to run a report and capture its output. Uh, this is in lieu of going onto the Cognos connection and clicking run. Um, and the notion here is that you would want to intercept this output to embed it into uh, another application. Now, there's two interfaces for CMS, um, a SOAP interface uh, used for uh, programmatic uh, in, say, a Java or a .NET type application, or a RESTful interface, uh, which is essentially a URL. And uh, I will be... Um, demonstrating the RESTful interface in a moment. 
Um, this lets you integrate Cognos content into new environments. So for example, you might have an application in which you would like to put the output of a report, uh, but you don't want to necessarily embed the Cognos viewer in your uh, interface. Uh, you would just want the output, thank you very much. So you would be able to invoke CMS, grab that output, um, potentially manipulate it, and then present that in the spot in your application that makes sense. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, wouldn't I do that with the SDK? Isn't that what the SDK is for? Uh, well, it turns out that the SDK and CMS are kind of complementary. So with the SDK, the notion here is you could programmatically do anything that you could sign into the Cognos connection and do. So if you were to want to set security settings, if you wanted to create a new data source, if you actually even wanted to write a report from scratch and store it in the Cognos connection uh, uh, and the content store more specifically, you would use the SDK to do that. You can do none of those things with CMS. CMS's whole job in life is to run reports and present you their output. So you can't write a new report, uh, you can't set security settings, you can't uh, create a data source. If you need to do those things programmatically, the SDK is for you. CMS is for when you wanna grab uh, a report, run it, grab that output and embed it in a portal, embed it in an application, maybe even pipe it to an external application all the way over to say a Google map widget. So you use the SDK to automate virtually any operation you could do through the Cognos connection. CMS, as I said, grab a report and incorporate it into your environment. Now from an output format perspective, the SDK does let you run reports and it would let you get reports in any number of output formats and so does CMS. Uh, CMS also has a couple of uh, specific output formats for it, um, LDX, which is a layout descriptive language and JSON. And again, you cannot report author with CMS, um, you can only run existing reports. Now in terms of using CMS, um, whether or not you have the SDK installed on your Cognos server, you could invoke your reports using a CMS interface. Uh, you need not install the SDK to get it. However, when you install the SDK, you get a whole bunch of samples um, that show you how to leverage CMS. So it's, I highly advise that if you're going to go with Cognos Mashup Services, go ahead and install the SDK because you'll get a, a whole bunch of uh, samples that are very instructive. Uh, as well as the uh, developer guide for Mashup Services as part of that install. Now, you might ask yourself, self, why would I use CMS instead of the viewer? So here is some notions around that that might help you make a decision between when the viewer is right for you and CMS is right for you. So if you wanted to use the viewer, you would typically invoke it um, and uh, present it in an iframe in your application. Uh, and if you go to the properties of any report and you look at the search path, one of the elements of the search path property sheet is this default URL. And the default URL is the URL that will invoke the Cognos viewer for that report. It's got the full path to the report. Um, it has a, uh, uh, a UI.run action says run, so it'll run it live. Um, you'll note in the sample URL there that B action is Cognos viewer. Right, so if you wanted to invoke the viewer, you could very easily just grab that URL from the properties of a report and you could invoke it. And the viewer provides all the functionality to present that report in your iframe. Uh, it's the entire viewer. So it's just like you clicked go on the uh, Cognos connection, either run with options or you clicked on the hyperlink. The notion here is that it runs, it's got the toolbar at the top. Um, you can then run in, in multiple outputs. It's got the drill up and your down buttons, all of those things. And those things actually you can turn off in this URL. Um, and for a lot of folks, that's the right thing to do because you actually don't want to duplicate all of that functionality in your own application, right? You want to embed Cognos's ability to do that for you. And a lot of times that's what you want. However, sometimes what you want is to be able to intercept that output prior to it being displayed and embed it in such a way that it's not part of a Cognos object in your page, but it's part of your page and therefore can reference any portion of your page. So when you embed the viewer in your application, it's really hosting a Cognos session inside an iframe on your page. And um, therefore you can't actually access the report output. The contents of the report are not possible for you to grab from outside of that iframe. Um, you can't manipulate that output before presenting it. The viewer does all the work. 
Uh, you can't therefore pipe that output to something else and, and present that something else like a Google map widget or something along those lines. Um, that report can't easily access functions that are embedded in your application. So if you wanted to, for example, have a way in the report to click on a piece of that report and have it invoke some JavaScript that's in the hosting page of the, the report, that's not really uh, possible when the report lives in a viewer. But if the report is part of your page, right, then it can absolutely access all pieces of your page, including any routines that you've embedded in your page. Also, if the, the viewer throws an error, your application can't easily trap that error. So if you need to be able to do any of those things I just described about intercepting and manipulating, about piping, about accessing routines, um, or making sure you can trap errors, then the viewer may not be the right way to go for that specific application. It could be that CMS is what you want. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a couple of uh, REST interface examples here. I've got some URLs that I've put together and I'm gonna use my demo environment and I'm gonna run a report and I'm going to uh, embed the output from that report in a viewer. So uh, I'm going to grab some URLs that I have here. Uh, the URLs are representing uh, a couple of things. Running a list report in layout format. Remember I said that LDX format's unique to CMS. I'll just show you that format by copying this URL into my browser. Um, you see that it uh, invokes the Cognos ISAPI or CGI, depending on what you've got set up. Um, RDS is the report data service. Uh, and so, you know, it's actually communicating directly to the report data service as opposed to going through the front end. This identifier is the um, identifier of the report that I'm running. Notice that this ampersand selection allows me to run just a piece of a report as opposed to running the whole report. So in this report that I'm running, there is a cross tab and a list. This URL is just going to run the list. So I'll go over to my Internet Explorer and I'll open a tab. And I'll just drop that URL in. And so now it's actually going to run the report and it's going to present to me the report in this layout format, which is essentially a, just an XML format that describes both the layout of the page as well as all of the data on the page. Now, it could be that this is a great format for you to grab and intercept and manipulate prior to presenting the data, um, or maybe not. Um, as it turns out, CMS, when you run a report, always runs it in LDX first, and then you can add parameters to the URL to have it convert it to another format. For example, um, I'm going to run a cross tab from this same report, and um, I'm going to present it in the format of HTML. There's that FMT parameter. So I'll just open a new tab, and I'll drop it in as HTML. Now you'll see it actually doesn't present me with um, the HTML uh, text. It actually processes the HTML and presents a cross tab. Um, so this is not really grabbable and, and uh, embeddable, if you will, into a web page uh, in this format. There's a special format called an HTML fragment that I'm going to run with, which I'm going to then use. I'll run that cross tab in HTML fragment format. Let me grab that. I'll drop it in here. Now, fragment, what it's going to return is the actual HTML on the page here, which I am just going to copy. And I'm going to paste it into a little web page that I've got set up. And I'm going to just drop that HTML. I'm going to paste it. Whoops, apparently I didn't copy it. Try that again. Okay, and I'll save this guy. And I'm just going to open up that guy so you can see. So there's my HTML fragment embedded in my HTML web page. Now, the notion here is, of course, after I have, uh, between the time I grabbed it and the time I displayed it, I could have manipulated it. Uh, uh, and, and so it didn't have to look exactly like this. Uh, so the HTML fragment is grabbable, and then I can emb embed it like this here. And this is not a viewer. There's, there's no toolbar. There's no um, uh, uh, 
uh, viewer functionality for drill up and drill down and rerun and those kinds of things. If I need that, of course, I would just embed the viewer. This is uh, uh, just an example of how I can use CMS to generate an output that I grab and I do something with. And that's just a simple example of doing that. So that is your quick whirlwind tour of Cognos Mashup Services. So if I go back to my presentation, a um, couple of things to think about. Um, one of the things that, that will happen is if uh, you have your application hosted in a, with a, on a different web server than Cognos is hosted on, uh, you could run into this cross-origin resource sharing problem where browsers try to prevent this. Browsers try to present, prevent your application from accessing resources on another server. There's, there's, it detects it as a, a potential invasion. Um, so you need to get around this. It's uh, uh, unless well, one way to get around it, of course, is to drop your application onto the same gateway as Cognos. That may not always be possible. Um, what we have found is uh, that you can add HTTP headers that are sent back to the browser by the Cognos gateway server. So it will um, resolve this problem for you. But we, what we find is that we've de you know, developing a JavaScript library that will proxy the communication with the Cognos server through an iframe that's served from the gateway. In other words, this, what this will do is it will make the application uh, uh, see the, the gateway server as part of your application, and therefore the cross-origin resource sharing problem won't come up. Uh, so that's how we've solved it. You may have other ways you can solve it, but the notion here is that you just need to be aware that when your application is hosted on server one and Cognos is hosted on server two, you're going to have to do something special to prevent this cross-origin resource sharing error from coming up. Now, there's a whole bunch of uh, resources out there for CMS. Uh, certainly, installing the SDK and reading the documentation and looking at the examples is the very first step that most of us would go through. Uh, DG underscore CMS is the PDF you're looking for in the, uh, the documentation folder. Um, there is also, in developer works, um, a good introduction, getting started with the Mashup Service document that you can download. Um, and I found that very instructive. Um, there is a developer works community around uh, CMS that would be uh, worth going ahead and uh, joining. Um, and then in version 10.2.2, um, which uh, I happen to have uh, the chance to go to Insight this year in Las Vegas and um, listen to uh, Steve Newman discuss some of the new features uh, probably coming out in 10.2.2. I have to say probably because it's not out yet. Um, uh, one of the things that targeting in 10.2.2 is that all the SDK and CMS documentation will be published to the IBM Knowledge Center. So at that time, you won't have to worry about installing this and that to get the documentation. You should be able to go right to the Knowledge Center. So again, that is your, your whirlwind tour of Cognos Mashup Services. And then I'm going to move on to Advanced Visualizations and the Rave Engine. Now we have a full hour on advanced visualizations and RAVE, and if you go to our YouTube channel, you'll be able to take a look at it. This is just a brief uh, uh, a recap of some of the information that's there. So an advanced visualization that was introduced in 10.2.1, um, and it was introduced with uh, active reports in the very first release of 10.2.1. Uh, uh, if you applied FixPack 1, then the uh, visualization notion became available for every kind of report, not just active reports, and became available in both co uh, uh, Cognos Workspace Advanced as well as in Report Studio. And what it does is it manifests as a new object in your toolbox. So just like you have charts and cross tabs and lists in your toolbox, you now have a tool called visualization in your toolbox that you could drag onto a report page and use uh, in lieu of or in conjunction with the library of Cognos charts that the chart tool gets you at. So a visualization is, if you will, an extension um, of a whole bunch of new charts. Uh, they're um, separate from the chart engine, which means that Cognos can add to them from time to time, independent of a release. Um, in fact, they can also be crowdsourced. Um, in fact, you might even want to author your own visualization um, and build your own chart type to add to Cognos. Um, and that's the notion of uh, visualizations that I think has most people very excited. Visualizations are extensible um, because not only can you modify the ones that exist and that you could download um, from the, the website analyticszone.com, uh, but you could also write your own with a free tool that's downloadable from that very same site. 
Now that customizer, um, that, that authoring tool, uh, is a, uh, a Java jar that you would invoke, and it allows you to um, modify any of the existing visualizations that you would download from analyticszone.com, or you could write uh, and roll your own. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring up that visualization tool live here. So this is the visualization tool. I've opened a visualization that is a, a bubble chart. And the, the language here on the left is what's known as VizJSON. Um, it's based on uh, the grammar of graphics. Um, that's uh, If you uh, Google that, I'm sure you'll find a, a ton of information about it. Um, do you ever wonder why the bubbles on the avatar, when you drag it into your report studio report, look like the bubbles on the avatar? Well, it's because in the definition of the object, you give it data to display when it shows you the object in design mode in report studio or Cognos Workspace Advanced. So the, a, a large part of this one is the data that it's presenting uh, in this layout. Uh, there's a whole bunch of properties, though. Uh, down here that talk about the drop zones that will be available to you in the tool, the colors um, that are going to be uh, used in the, uh, the object when you display it. If you will, the palette is presented right here and you control the palette yourself in this definition. So you would, um, let's say, download the basic form of this from analyticszone.com. You would open this visualizer tool. You would tweak it so that it maybe used your color scheme um, or, or had uh, another uh, property change in it. And then you would upload this to your Cognos server on the library tab. So uh, in the Cognos server um, administration screen, you have a library tab. And on the library tab, you would be able to upload any of the visualizations you've created or any of the visualizations you might have downloaded from the analyticszone.com. And here are some that I have loaded. So when I go and author a report, these are the visualizations that will come up when I drag over the visualization tool. Keep in mind that when you install 10.2.1 and you get the visualization tool and you drag it over, um, it will show up with no objects in the library because the library starts out empty. You actually have to go to the analyticszone.com and download uh, those, those uh, objects and then upload them to your Cognos server on this tab. Then when you use the visualization tool, you'll actually get a list of visualizations you can use. So it was sort of funny when I installed the first time and dragged visualization over that it showed me there were no visualizations. I sort of expected there might be some seed ones in the installation. There are not. So there's a, uh, uh, just a, a quick reminder that you have to go download a few. So once you've downloaded them, perhaps tweaked them with the customization tool, um, now you can grab that visualization tool and drop it into Cognos Workspace Advanced or Report Studio. And in Report Studio, you could do, drop these into a regular report or into an active report. And so let me show you uh, a couple of examples of using these in a reporting context. I have an active report that I'll show you here. Um, one of the things that you have to make sure you do when you're going to use a visualization in an active report is that you've installed Microsoft Silverlight. If you haven't installed Silverlight, this is the error you're going to get. Okay, so you need to uh, be sure for Internet Explorer that you uh, have installed Silverlight um, before you can use an active report with visualizations. Um, if you're going to use visualizations in uh, uh, Firefox, uh, then you need to, um, uh, in an active report, they will work just fine. Um, you have to have... Uh, uh, Silverlight installed, but remember to use Active Reports in Firefox, you also have to install the add on UNMHT um, for you to use the Active Reports there. Okay, but let me show you visualizations in uh, actual use here um, by uh, actually creating one on my server. So I'm going to launch Cognos Workspace Advanced. And I'll use a dimensional package. And it'll launch CWA, just like you would expect. And it's going to ask me for what template to use uh, when I create the new. And I'm just going to go with a blank one because there's no visualization template out of the box. 
So I've got a, a nice empty report. I'll go to my toolbox. I'll grab my visualization tool and drop it on my page. And see, those are the visualizations that were in my library tab. You remember my library tab had uh, seven entries in it. These are the seven entries there. I'm going to go ahead and use that packed bubble and click OK. And I'm going to go to uh, my data and I will grab a measure and drop it in the measure drop zone. And you'll notice it does not render. Um, in general, in the 10.2.1 release, um, visualizations won't render until every drop zone has at least one value in it. So it'll magically render as soon as I drop in something for my bubbles and something for my series. So I'm going to drop all my products in my bubbles. And I'm going to drop um, some years into my series. And it will now display my visualizations. So uh, each uh, bubble represents a product line and um, each uh, color scheme represents a year. Now this is a dimensional report and if I turn on drilling and run this in a Cognos viewer, it will drill. So when I click on personal accessories, it will drill down on personal accessories and I clicked on the gr dark green which is 2012. So of course when you click in a chart on a piece of a chart it drills on both axes and it did exactly that for me here. So it drilled down on personal accessories and shows me the product types under personal accessories and it drilled down on 2012 and it shows me the quarters in 2012. And I can drill up by right clicking and doing my drill up just like I would for uh, any other type of object. So you see a visualization um, is a, a whole collection of new charts that untethers you from the standard chart library in Cognos so that you can uh, extend it, you can write your own, you can take some that someone else has written and you can tweak uh, to, to make it your own. And um, the notion here is that perhaps the way to ex best express the data in your application is not with a bar chart or a pie chart, some, one of the standard charts, but instead is best illustrated by a custom chart. And that's what this notion of a visualization does. Now I'm often asked, what is that rave thing? Well, the rave is the engine that actually builds the image. So the, the Rave engine is baked into Cognos 10.2.1 and it'll run up on the server and present these outputs and that's what it did here. When I do it in an active report, for the visualizations to work in the active report, Cognos has to actually embed the Rave engine in the MHT itself. And it actually renders the visualizations on the fly uh, in the active report, which is kind of cool. and has a couple of implications. So with that all said, I'm going to um, move to this last slide here, a couple of considerations. Visualizations have been enhanced in 10.2.2. For example, that whole drop zones uh, have to all be filled in before it presents um, is uh, theoretically going to be addressed in 10.2.2 when it comes out so that if I drop in just a measure, I get an output. If I then drop in a bubble, I get an output. So it's not going to require that all the, the drop zones are filled in prior to uh, generating a, a visualization. Um, uh, I mentioned that in active reports, they drop um, the uh, Rave engine into the MHT file, which means you do not place visualizations in data decks like you do charts and do master detail relationships between the, uh, the deck and the visualization. Um, you actually use a filter uh, option, not a select option on the visualization, and it will render the visualization on the fly. Uh, and that's very important because putting them in a deck actually defeats one of the beautiful things about visualizations. And that is if you have um, a, a lot of data that generate a lot of visualizations, it doesn't artificially increase the size of your MHT file. If I have a thousand possible charts in an MHT file, it'll actually embed all thousand in my deck. Um, and that can make a very large MHT file with a visualization because it's not in a data deck. It's not using the master detail approach to presenting them. It's not pre-rendering them all. Um, it will, generally speaking, um, result in a much, much smaller MHT file than the equivalent thousand charts would have. Do keep in mind that for one or two visualizations, the Rave engine takes a couple of meg. Um, so you are, you know, it does take up some space. Maybe charts would be smaller. So the smaller thing is when you're using large numbers of charts versus a visualization that will render on the fly. 
when you're going to create your own visualizations from scratch, um, keep in mind that getting in and just playing until you get something that looks right, right, is not maybe the, the most efficient way to go. It's maybe the best way to learn. But in terms of actually getting in and being efficient about, let me come up with a new visualization for my, uh, my end user, keep in mind that you know, you're trying to, to, to make a decision about the best way to help the customer uh, get the value of your data. So what decision are you trying to facilitate should be foremost in your mind? And what relationships on the axes should be foremost in your mind? You should really almost draw out what you're, you're hoping to get prior to going in and trying to code it. It'll be much more efficient for you. From a resources perspective, the analyticszone.com is your friend. There's all kinds of information out there, including the visualizations and the customizer itself. And the customizer tool um, comes with some pretty good documentation that gets you going and gives you a number of examples to try to truly understand uh, this whole notion of building and rolling your own visualization. Now I'm going to turn the uh, mic over to my colleague, David Russell, who's going to talk to you about uh, framework manager automation. Thank you very much, Rich. So we're going to talk about framework automation and we'll start by sort of defining what is framework automation. So the idea is that we're going to change the report author's view of the report package, but we're not going to actually use framework manager like you normally would. So this means that we're going to use, uh, we're going to take a couple of different approaches you can take to doing this. We're either going to programmatically update the, uh, the framework model using the SDK, or we could modify it directly. But essentially, we're just going to get rid of framework manager. And if we want to change the report package view on the left and change some names or things that, or even structure, of that, we'll replace that with probably a .NET or a Java SDK application. Uh, again, if you're going to modify the uh, package directly, you could use another language. The difficulty is you'll want to use the SDK to actually publish that resulting package. So we'll get to that in a little bit more detail in a moment. So why not just use Framework Manager? So in general, we're dealing with a situation where we have highly configurable, configurable applications that might allow your users to make changes uh, that you want to have reflected in the framework. So why might you want to do that? So examples, I have customers that we've worked with that uh, want to allow their users to change the names effectively of dimensions in their model or of even uh, attributes of dimensions. And that needs to result in changing the name of a query subject or changing the name of a query item. So rather than waiting for their uh, professional services department to make changes for their customers, they allow their customer to go into the user interface, change the name of dimension. That impacts their entire application. They've embedded Cognos as their reporting tool, and in their application, that dimension is name, the new dimension name is used throughout the application. They want that to be reflected in the report studio when, or any of the studios when they go to design a report. And so we programmatically update the framework model, republish the package, and now the next time someone goes in to use that package in a studio, they will see the same name in Report Studio that they see in the application itself. Um, and so that is one example. They you know, can also change structure, add new query items. You know, I mentioned attributes in their application. They can add a new attribute to a dimension. So that requires adding new structural objects, new query subjects, new query items. And that's being done as well on the fly to keep things in sync with their backend application. Um, in some cases, we've generated the entire framework model from scratch. Now, this is a much more involved process, requires a lot more metadata to describe what you want the framework model to look like. It's not like you can just point something at your database and say, poof, there you go. I, you can almost do that in Framework Manager itself for a pure star schema. But other than that, it's, uh, it's difficult without some fairly significant metadata. But the example here was one customer has an application that uh, prior to Cognos, it's a 20-year-old application, uh, that allows their users to create their own views that actually get instantiated in the database. 
Uh, and in order to reflect those new views in the uh, framework model, the metadata describing those views that the user created through their user interface is used to build the appropriate objects in the framework model to represent those new views and then present those to the user through the, the package once that's been republished. Um, so how does framework automation work? So as I mentioned before, there are really two options for modifying the framework. You can either make SDK calls to the metadata service, and this effectively uses the same XML language describing changes that framework manager stores in your log files. Um, so effectively, you can take those XML messages that you might normally play back through BMT script player, generate messages like that, send those to the metadata service through the SDK, and actually have that uh, perform those changes to the framework model on disk. You can also directly manipulate the model XML file uh, the, in the Framework Manager SDK uh, documentation. They actually describe the XML, the XML document, so you can make those changes directly. Uh, there's some risks there in the sense that if you make lots of modifications to the XML document, you won't know what the problem is until you publish it. And when you publish the whole framework model and it tells you there's an error, it may not tell you what the error was. So you may not be able to know what you did wrong when you were modifying the XML file. So there's some risk there. And you know, you've got a layer of indirection there with the SDK uh, calls that may help you in the long run, but you know, both are supported. Um, there are a couple of different options for managing the model file. Um, you can work with the complete framework model, essentially working with the original model that you've saved somewhere and that you can access from your application. Um, that's the safest way to deal with things because that model has all of the objects that you would expect to be there and you can code against that model and nothing will change on you. Um, the other option is you can make SDK calls and extract the published package from the content store and write that to disk as your starting point because that the model XML file that's part of the framework model is actually stored there. The difficulty there is that it's actually a pruned version of the model so it only contains the objects that were actually referenced by that package. So some of the objects that you expected to be in the framework model might not be there, uh, particularly ones that perhaps you had modeled as a baseline that you would use in certain situations but hadn't used it yet before you publish the package, those objects will get pruned out. And so when you pull it from the content store, you don't have the whole model available to you. So that's a riskier uh, method for dealing with the model file, but it does allow you to do some things uh, in certain cases that might make that useful. Um, in general, the changes are made to a file on disk and then you essentially save that and then publish the result to the content store. Um, publishing those update, updated packages does require an SDK call. So in general, this is gonna be an SDK application even if you're manipulating the file directly instead of making SDK calls to the metadata service. So we're modifying packages on the fly with reports published, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, and there's a few things that can go wrong. In particular, um, you could break reports. So if you're not using durable modeling techniques, this could be a really good time to start. Effectively, uh, you wanna protect yourself from changes to object names that are used to reference objects from reports in the framework model. So if you weren't using durable modeling techniques, which is effectively setting a design language and modeling everything in the design language and then using other languages for presentation purposes, um, the difficulty is that if you're not using a separate design language and you do change the name of an object in the single language of your model, uh, your reports won't be able to find that object anymore because they will have been using the name in that single language to reference everything. So that would create a situation where just simply changing a name would break several reports. Um, the other thing that, to be aware of is that you can use the model differences and show impacts features that are in Framework Manager. You can make calls to the metadata service 
to return XML descriptions of what reports in the content store might have been impacted by a change that you've made. You can use that to at least make you aware of or make your users aware of the reports that a particular change has impacted or may impact. Um, and as I mentioned before, if you're extracting the model from the content store, you need to be aware of expected objects that may have been pruned because that has created problems for us in the past and you may run into it yourselves. So some resources available to you. There is a framework manager developer guide that has a description of the format of the model XML document and it also has a high level description of some of the types of changes you can make with the uh, XML messages that DMT script player would use. Um, there's also a document on durable modeling techniques, so if you need to be looking into that, you can follow that link to read more about that. And the Framework Manager User's Guide also mentions some things here. Uh, usually the technique when you are doing the SDK directly is that you're using Framework Manager to make a change that you're interested in to generate the XML and then writing code to generate XML messages that you'll send to the metadata service. And so knowing something about Framework Manager is fairly important as well and how that interacts so that you can write that code effectively. So that takes care of my section, so I'll hand it back over to Mr. Chester to talk about mobile themes for the iOS application. Thanks, David. So this is a, a, a quick little section um, to uh, introduce you to the notion of branding the IBM Cognos application for the iOS platform. So the iOS platform, uh, iPad, iPad uh, mini, uh, iPhone, uh, you go to the uh, application store, you download IBM Cognos, and you get um, a default look and feel to the IBM Cognos application. Well, it turns out that that default look and feel is something that you can brand, that you can customize, um, following a, a, a very simple three-step process. Um, and that uh, starting in 10.2.1 Fix Pack 2, um, you can download the, the definition for the theme that is the default theme, and then you can modify it. And so you could add your logo, you could add custom graphics, you can do virtually any web page you'd like to um, present on the, the mobile device when your users run it. Um, three steps, like I said. The first step is to enable mobile theme support. By default, it's off. Um, what you need to do is log into the administration section of your Cognos server. Um, there is a mobile tab. And on that mobile tab, you'll find a server configuration section. And in there, you'll find mobile theme support. It'll say themes off. You want to do themes on with a capital O. Then you'd like to craft a theme. So the, um, the way to do this is to download a zip file from your Cognos installation server. So up on the server under uh, templates mobile, uh, you'll find a zip file called defaultTheme.zip. And if you unzip it, it's going to show you there are five folders. There's only one folder of interest as far as what I'm talking about, and that is the folder called main panel. And in there, there's an index.html, which is the welcome page. If you open it, you'll see the, that, that boxy graphic for the IBM uh, welcome screen. And you can then edit that uh, index.html in any way that you see fit um, with any tool that you see fit. And then you can rezip uh, those five folders up, upload them to your server, and um, when people log in, they'll get that theme. The upload step is you go to that self-same mobile tab. You go to the mobile uh, configuration, the third step, and you um, give your theme a name. You browse to that zip file, and then you assign it to uh, a group or a role. Um, this indicates which users uh, are going to inherit this theme when they log on. So, you know, you might have 20 themes. You might have a theme per uh, customer of yours uh, that is branded with your logo and their logo, if you like. And then you just assign the, the groups or roles from your authentication source so that when client one signs on, they get the theme for, their, for them. When client two signs on, they get their theme and so on. Okay. 
Um, I'm going to just show you all of those pieces um, before we get into the considerations. So I um, have a zip file um, that is essentially a copy of the zip from uh, my server. So that default theme zip. So if I open up this zip, you'll see that I have a bunch of folders. I've uh, unzipped those folders into here. So these are the folders. And under main panel, there is this index.html. Now, this index.html rep uh, references some images in the images folder that's here. Um, it's just plain old HTML that you could manipulate directly if um, uh, that was your, your want. It, uh, uh, you could do it in a Microsoft front page. You could do it in any one of the authoring tools there. What I did was I simply manipulated the images that were the default images and the default theme. So what I did is I went and I actually used uh, MS Paint. And um, as you might be able to see, let's see if this will actually open for me. Um, there, I edited that boxy image and I dropped the LPA systems image right in the middle of it just so that I could do a, a quickie theme. Um, I zipped up those folders and now they're living in this LPA themes.zip. So I'm going to jump onto my server and um, get out of there. And let me just quickly jump onto here as an administrator. I'll launch the administration tool. I'll go to my mobile tab and I'll go to my server configuration. And as I said earlier, by default, mobile theme support is off. You need to turn it on by changing this entry and scrolling to the bottom and hitting apply mobile configuration. You need not restart your Cogno server or anything like that. These changes will take effect immediately. Um, you can wait all you want for this message to go away. I certainly did the first time. It doesn't until you click the little X in the corner. And now my configuration change is saved. So next thing I'll do is go to the mobile UI configuration and I will upload a theme. So I'll give it a name. I'll spell it correctly. I'll browse to my desktop and let me grab my LPA themes.zip file. And I'm going to assign it to a, a group or role. Now, in this case, I'll just do something very, very simple. Everybody gets this theme. So I will, I will choose the everyone group and click OK. And I'll assign everyone to this. Um, in, uh, in real life, this would probably be unusual that everybody got one theme, unless you want to just brand it with your company. Um, and everybody, all of your clients um, would get that same theme. But uh, I would think that it would be more common, perhaps, to have multiple themes, one that was branded with you and your customers' logos or something along those lines. But whatever makes sense for you, you upload one or more of these themes. And now in my case, anyone who logs in uh, on the uh, mobile device on the iOS platform only, this doesn't affect the Android uh, world, uh, at least not yet. Uh, and I don't know what's coming in 10.2.2 relative to that, I must say. Um, at this point, anyone who logged in would say their iPad would now get this theme. Now, unfortunately, I don't have any way to share with you my iPad. After, ha after having done this, while it will work, I can't prove it to you because I have no way to share with you uh, uh, during this webinar my iPad. So I took a picture of my iPad, and that's my iPad. Um, post the theme. So you, so you remember that image that I edited that I, I dropped the LPA uh, systems logo into? There it is, right? Um, so all I did was I logged into my iPad. Um, it still will present the default theme when you first log in after setting up the themes. Um, it, actually, the, it actually downloads it after that initial login. Um, it's when you log out and log back in the second time that you'll see it. So you do need to be careful there. I, I thought it didn't work the first time because I logged in and I got the old theme. Well, it turns out that you have to log in. In that session, it downloads the theme. And then the second time you log in, it uses that theme. I'll go back a slide and just talk about some considerations. Um, first of all, you know, as you see for each theme, you uh, apply a group or a role. 
So, uh, you know, which users get which theme? Well, you, just be careful that you don't assign it such that uh, one user gets three themes, because then you're not really sure which theme it's going to get um, for that user. Uh, if a user logs in and has no access to a custom theme, no worries. Uh, they'll get the default theme. So it's not like if you start using themes and you, you put it up for one group, you now have to account for every group in the system uh, with a different theme. No. Cognos will use the default theme uh, unless it finds a theme that matches the logged in user, and then it'll use the, the custom theme. Also, there's no way to update the default theme. Um, changing that zip file and putting it back on the server and restarting services, you might think, oh, then that'll change the default theme and it's all good. No, there's actually no way for you to change that default theme. Um, that is what it is. If you need to change the default theme, you just follow this process and assign it to the everyone group. And now that's your new default theme. Um, I already mentioned that the theme is downloaded the first time uh, the user logs in. Um, now, if your user has connected to multiple servers on their same device, which, as you know, is possible to do with the mobile application, um, the theme they'll see for all of their logins is the theme associated with the very first login they did on that device. So if I've got a, a login for server one, server two, server three, ser and they all have custom themes that are different, and I configured my, my iPad for server one first, that's the theme for all server one, two, and three interactions. Um, for me to um, change my theme, I actually have to delete my connections and re-add them, and then it'll go and grab the new theme. Once it's got a theme, it doesn't go and update the theme again. Okay, um, so those are your considerations for the mobile theme. Um, this process and um, the steps are all described in the, uh, the mobile install and admin guide in chapter number five. So that IG underscore MOB PDF is the one you're looking for. So everything I just talked to you about is described there. And with that, um, it looks like we have a few minutes for some questions. So hopefully uh, you folks have been entering questions in your, uh, your window there on uh, WebEx. So, oh, yep, looks like they have. Um, by the way, we will um, answer all the questions you've entered, whether we have time to do them during the webinar or not. We'll just follow up with an email afterwards. So I uh, apologize if we don't get to your question live, but uh, I can uh, promise you that we will answer your questions um, that you've submitted, regardless of whether we can talk about them right now. But let's get to the first one. Okay, uh, this one has to do with CMS. How does user security get applied when you use CMS? That's an excellent question. So um, I think we all know that when you use Cognos, there's no way to bypass security. Um, security is always on, and um, whenever you run a report, it has to exist in a session. So it turns out with CMS, um, there is a log on method and a log off method that you would uh, bookend around any interactions you had running reports. So the user that you log on with um, is um, the user whose security gets applied whenever you run a report. So if you've got um, data filters that are user specific, if you have uh, multi-tenancy turned on in terms of um, data source connections, so what data source will be accessed based on the logged in user, all of that is applied just like they'd logged in interactively. So you use the login method, uh, which I bypassed simply because I logged on to my server interactively before the webinar started. So you didn't see me log on, but I had a logged on session. So when I pasted those URLs in, it was using the ID I logged in with. But normally you'd have, in the, let's say the REST interface, you'd have a log on action, then you'd have your um, RDS run report actions, and then you'd have a log off action. So that's how user security gets applied. All right, the next question. I tried to get custom themes working, but after following everything you said, it, <laughs> it didn't work. Do you have any ideas? Um, well, I can't say exactly what's gone wrong for you, um, but I will tell you what went wrong for me the first time. Um, it was a simple blunder, but it was a blunder. So you remember that when you expanded the default theme, I told you it created um, these five folders. And of course, I, I expanded them and I dropped them into its own folder. Right? And I did all my changes on these guys. And what I did when I zipped is I didn't select these five folders and create a zip file from them. I decided to be uh, efficient, and I simply created a zip file out of that folder. That doesn't work. You actually have to create a zip file that just contains these five folders. There can't be an extra folder on top of them and have the custom theme work. 
So my blunder, um, and I, I can't say whether this is the same uh, problem that you're having, but that was one problem that I had. Um, once I got that squared away and I, my zip file contained the five folders and not five folders in another folder, it, it just worked for me. Um, but remember, still, you log on, it's not going to show you the custom theme. You have to log on, give it some time to download the theme, log off, and log on again before you'll see the theme. Uh, so hopefully that'll help you. All right. Um, the next question, uh, David, this one's for you. Um, how can I customize a framework model on a customer by customer basis, but still use framework automation on it so that I can apply my centrally managed metadata changes? All right, so here I'm assuming that they'd like to use framework manager on a framework model, um, but also be able to use framework automation to apply changes. Are there any guidelines for that, David? There are no real specific guidelines. This really becomes sort of a case by case process. This is a, usually involves getting your framework modelers and your developers to agree on what their standards of development are really on both sides so that you know if you're writing code that's going to make changes to the framework model that you're aware of what specific objects within the framework model you can actually rely on being there and that the framework modelers won't touch, if you will. And by the same token, you have to communicate with the framework modelers so that when they're making the customer specific changes that they aren't doing anything that would interfere with the uh, way your code is actually manipulating this. So this is actually probably one of the first considerations because it really impacts your changes to the framework model that you're allowed to make, even if you're not customizing it on a customer by customer basis. But if you're just making modifications to update the framework model from version to version or to make changes uh, to fix problems with the model, you need to be aware of what those rules that you're that you're working by on both in the code and in the framework model so they can continue to communicate and so you have to keep those two groups working together to keep things in sync and that's uh, something that's definitely a consideration that we didn't mention before so that was a great question all right all right well i am getting the high sign that we are out of time um uh, thank you very much for joining us today on behalf of david john and myself we appreciate uh, that you joined us. Um, again, a reminder, if you are submitting questions through your chat window and we didn't happen to get to them, um, never fear, we will respond to you after the webinar with uh, the answers to your questions. Um, and again, thank you so much.